So my message this morning comes out of Psalm chapter 18, and we're about to read it, verses 1 through 8. And I want you to know that as we read these verses, that I want, this is the psalmist David, David, King David, King of Israel. He's the greatest king known. He's a, the Bible refers to G, him as being a type of Jesus that would come. You know, Jesus was the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And Jesus' heritage or his earthly heritage comes from the lineage of King David. As a matter of fact, Matthew records the lineage of through Solomon, which would have been uh, Joseph's lineage. And, and many scholars believe that, that Luke covers Mary's lineage, which brings back to Nathan, which was also one of David's offspring. And so, so in that, and the Bible says that Jesus is going to rule on the throne of David. And so I want you to know that David, if you haven't read, 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 Powerful character that sometimes shows Christ or Jesus that would come, but sometimes shows believers. And in and, 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 and much of what we're going to read this morning in Psalm 18, so he wrote the Psalms. You, you, sp- you see how you spell that word right there? I remember one time I was talking to some guy, and I'm not, I don't, I'm not making fun, but he said, I, I, I was reading Palms today. All right? It's Psalms, and, and it's another word for a song. See, David was also a musician. I mean, this guy was a something, man. He, I mean, he was a warrior. He's the one that took down Goliath, my friend. This ain't some fairy tale. He was a teenage boy, teenage man that took the giant down through the strength and the power of the Lord. He trusted in the confidence of God. He did not have trust in himself. God had already shown up for him on more than one occasion, and he believed God would give him the victory. Amen. And, but at the same time, as a, even a younger boy, He would be in the field writing songs. He wrote so many psalms. And he would play the harp and he would write songs to the Lord, giving God glory. Throughout his life, he would do that whenever he would go through things. And so when we read Psalm 18, verses 1 through 8, it's actually a long psalm. uh, I want you to know that he, as a man that loves God, is going through a struggle. Matter of fact, he's been through many struggles, and we'll talk about that to set some more context in a moment. But let's go ahead and let's read the passage. This is the psalmist David writing a song to the Lord in the midst, or probably after he's just gone through some major trials in his life. He says, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock. Is that the first time y'all ever did that song? Uh, about that y'all were just singing about the rock and all that stuff in there it sounded like it was a psalm i think it was but anyway that's the first time y'all ever sang it and that's what i'm trying to say it kept saying rock in here and one of my focal points in this message was rock and they ain't never sang that song before it's just god never ceases to amaze me the lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer my god my strength in whom i will trust He's my buckler. We'll talk about that in a second. And the horn of my salvation and my high tower. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. The sorrows of death compassed me. The floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him, even into his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations also of the hills moved and were shaken because he was wroth. Another word for angry. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word, O Lord God. We pray that, (laughs) Holy Spirit, you are the true preacher and teacher, and you're the one that we need this morning. We pray that you would show up, Lord. I pray that you'd move me out of the way, Lord, that my flesh would not get in the way, and that you would move by your spirit, Lord God, and that your word would be spoken, and that you would allow your word, Lord God, your eternal word, to settle into the hearts of people this morning, Lord, and 
that it would be like a seed in fertile soil and that it would take root and that it would begin to bear fruit. Lord, many times you cannot even see a seed when it germinates. It's still under the soil, but it's growing stronger and roots are being made. Lord, sometimes we won't even know when or how that seed was planted and watered, Lord, but we will one day see the fruit in our hearts and lives. And so I pray, Lord God, that you would do what only you can do, Lord. You're the one that changes hearts. You're the one that changes lives. And so we welcome you here. We welcome you in this message. We welcome you in your word. We welcome you in our hearts and lives. And we ask, Lord God, that you would do your work in Jesus' name. So the struggle is real, amen? (laughs) But God is greater. I want you to know that. The struggle is real. I already know you know that part, but I want you to know that God is greater. And I want you to know that that David, the psalmist, understood that. Whenever we get an introduction into the struggles of David's life, uh, you know, look, some of the things that David dealt with were just persecution from the world around him, and he was doing the right thing. But at the same time, some of the things that David dealt with was because of sin in his life. And many times whenever we, you know, we don't want to hear that part of it right? We just rather, just, just, come on, preacher, just keep the stuff where David was doing all the right things. Like, you know, he was just minding his own business that day whenever he was tending sheep and they called him from the field when he was anointed to be king. And that's just when everything got started in his life. Everything, all the trouble started then, you know, and then he was minding his own business, doing what his daddy told him to bring cheese and wine to his brothers on the battlefield. And there he sees Goliath dogging everybody. And he just, he said, is there not a cause? And then he went and he found those five smooth stones and he sunk one in the head of the giant and he relieved that lion devil of his head and his power. And what was he doing wrong? He wasn't doing anything wrong. And then then one day he brings the presence of the Lord back. You know, I was thinking about this too when we were singing and about what Gabby said and about that song when it says, I dance around the truth. What am I so afraid of? You know, what, what am I... What am I so afraid of? You know, and, and how many, so many times we don't want to be seen by people in, in a negative light, you know, and, and people are coming against us. And, and whenever, whenever he went over there to that battlefield and he started to say, is there not a cause? How are we going to let the, the name of our God be defied? And his older brother, you know, was despi- despised him for that. Because you, you never know the effect that your, your life is going to have on another person. And if, and, if you're, and if a person is another believer and they're not really moving forward with the things of God, you might not even be trying to give them a hard time. You might be trying to encourage them. But guess what? The enemy is going to come in and cause them to feel frustrated and feel like you're, it, that you're beating them down. When in reality, you're just, you're just excited about what the Lord has done in your heart and in your life. And, and sometimes these things happen. And, and, the, and the question is, what am I so afraid of? So who's going to live for the Lord? Amen. Is, and, and, and that's one of the things. David did many right things. And, and, and after he killed Goliath, he, would also, he was called on for a period of time to, to play music for King Saul. And, and he would just humble himself, and he'd play music for Saul, and the Lord would minister to King Saul during those times. But you know what ended up happening is that Saul ended up hating him. And, and it's like when you look at these times in his life, like, what is he doing wrong here? Why are people turning against him? And then there's one time, listen, the, the Ark of the Covenant of God, I mean, let's just take a little moment for Sunday school, Okay. In Exodus 25, 8, that's Old Testament, second book in the Bible. During the time frame of Moses, God is about to deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt, or he has delivered them out of Egypt, and he said, I want you to make a tabernacle for me. It's good that I actually mentioned this because there's a scripture that talks about tabernacle in my message. I want you to make a tabernacle for me. Simply means a tent. I want you to make a tent for me so that my presence can dwell with my people. And the way that God's presence dwelled with his people was that in this tent, there was a big opening. I'm not going to go into all the details because it would take me a while. And then there was a veil. And beyond the veil, there was the Ark of the Covenant. Anybody watch Raiders of the Lost Ark before? 
Come on, somebody. I know you probably have. That what they were looking for, that ark, that's what the whole movie was about. The ark of the covenant. They've never found it. They found other articles, but they've never found the ark of the covenant. The ark of the covenant was beyond that veil, and that's where God said, build me a tent so that my presence can dwell with my people. Well, look, when Saul was king, the people took the ark of God, which represents the presence of God and represents the power of God, to go fight the Philistines. But guess what? They were in disobedience to God, so God took their power away from them. And so the ark of the covenant was not with God's people for quite some time, several, many years. And then one day David said, oh, no, we're going to get the presence of the Lord. And I, it's a long story, but I want you to know that Dave, as the ark was finally making it back to the city, what this means is, is that the presence of God is coming back to the city of Jerusalem. The name Jerusalem means shalom. It means peace. I need you to understand there's a place for the believer, for you today, of peace. When the presence of God is in the right place, in your heart and in your life, you can have peace in your life. And David was excited. The presence of the God is, of God is finally coming home. And, and the Bible says that he took his outer garment off. And I don't know what they look like when they dance back there, and I'm not going to try. But I'm imagining that he's twirling and that he's excited and that he's singing for the Lord. And he's, and he's going, listen. And the, and the Bible says that all the, the women were out there, and they were like just, every, it was just a big old explosion of celebration. You know, they'd been talking about David for a long time. I mean, he was a man's man, and all the women loved him, and all the men, like, re revered him. And, and, and here he is out here just dancing for the Lord because he knows what God has done in his life, and he knows what God is doing. He was excited about the presence of God. He was a man's man, but he was excited about the presence of God. Ain't none of us in this room could have whooped him, I can tell you that. And, and, and as he's doing this, his wife, which was Saul's daughter, her name was Michael, she says, oh, you made a fool of yourself in front of all the women today. And I was thinking as we were worshiping, that's what a lot of people think about Christians, right, right. you know? Oh, man, he's just a fool, man. Look at how he acts. And you know what David said? As I was thinking, as I got down on my knees, I'm like, Lord. David said this. He said, I will make myself more undignified than this. God, I was thinking about how the world perceives things. And I was thinking about even, and I can't help it, Gabby, I know you just finally came up here and did what the Lord asked you, and all you said was serve him, and the Lord touched you. But, but I think I thought about that. I thought about being a cheerleader, not that I would know what it's like. But I've been around cheerleaders, and I've seen how they can act. Okay, and I imagine myself in a, in a group of people. It don't have to be cheerleaders. It just be a bunch of fancy doctors and whatever that are snooty and think they got something figured out. I've been around a lot of them too. And guess what? I still talk about Jesus in front of them. And if it makes them think that I'm undignified, I'm about to get a little bit more undignified up in this house. Because if there's one thing that I've learned in life is they ain't got the answer, my friend. Oh, I done been around them. I went to Cathedral Carmel and Lafayette. I've been around all them people that thought they had so much money. And all, all they talked about was their daddy's jets and the hangers and all this kind of money. Oh, we flying to the Bahamas and da, 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 da. Look, it's a bunch of emptiness. It's a bunch of lies. It's a bunch of garbage. They're empty on the inside. They need to be filled up with the truth of God. And if any of y'all been around it, y'all know what I'm talking about. Y'all have experienced. That's the, I wanted to talk to you about the struggles of David's life. He said, I'm about to get more undignified. Whatever. He was the king. You understand? If anybody had a right to be pompous, it would have been him. But he said, I'm about to get more undignified in the presence of the Lord. Because he came to a realization in his life and all of his struggles that God was worthy. So he's doing a lot of right stuff, my friend. At the same time, he's a real human being and he's done a lot of wrong stuff. He's done a lot of wrong stuff, and because of the things that he's done, now, so, now some of the persecution that came on him came on him before Bathsheba. If you don't know the story of Bathsheba, King David ended up taking another man's wife, sleeping with her, and then try, and, and had her husband killed. Dude, it's a mess, okay? It is a mess. But even before he did that, Saul was trying to kill him. And then after he does that, all kind of stuff is being poured on his heart and in his life. And I can tell you, let me just tell you this, Christian. If you open up the door to sin, you think, if you invite the devil over for dinner, 
I just want you to know something. You think he going to eat and he going to make himself at home. He, he, listen to me. Can you imagine the worst case scenario? You invited some strong man into the house and then he sat down and he, and look, even in front, even in front of the man of the house. You're like, oh no, y'all all going to sit down. We're about to have dinner and you about, this is my house now. See, this is my house now. I don't care. You can go. I know where you got your gun hidden. You, you ain't going to make it there. And now he's controlling and he's ruling and he ain't leaving. And you're telling them you want him to go. No, look, look, when you invite the devil over for dinner, wow. he ain't just going to eat, but he's going to want to stay. Wow. Now, I got to tell you that the one that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. And, and listen, hallelujah. And good, like, guess what? The devil ain't welcome in your house because, see, if you're serving the Lord, then your house is the Lord's house. And the Lord don't want that lying devil up in his house. Amen. The Lord don't want to have nothing to do with him. The Lord cast him out. Amen. And if you call on the name of the Lord and you want the devil gone, the Lord will cast him out. The God you serve is more powerful than him. And so in the midst of all of this, though, David's on the run, man. And I mean, he's being persecuted, left there. His own son, one of his sons, and it gets bad, my friend. One of his own sons rapes his sister. That's how bad it gets. You don't want to talk about drama in the family. You thought you had a dysfunctional family. Yeah. Oh, and that story right there will break your heart. Oh, Lord, I'm going to preach it one day. But, I mean, because it's just like sin. Entices you, whispers to you, tells you, come on over here. You know, and then, and then it, once it has you, it just throws you away. Makes your clothes all dirty and throws you out the door and locks the door behind you and laughs at you. And that's what sin does. That's Amnon. That's David's son, Amnon, what he did to his sister. And listen, and then his son, his other son, Absalom, said, you, you did what to my sister? And killed him, killed his own brother. Wow. And then Absalom turns around and tries to, like, make a public ridicule out of his dad, puts his daddy on the run. He was outside the camp. Listen, I didn't plan on talking about none of this. But if you can imagine, his son Absalom, after he done killed Amnon, his brother, and he's walking around outside the city gates, and as the people are coming in to see the king, he's like, hey, I'm out here bidding my daddy's business. How you doing today, sir? Yes, how's your family doing? How, how's little Billy? I remember he had a little something going on. Is there some kind of way that I can help you out with little Billy? Uh, and, then, and then the next one comes and, hey, look, has my dad really been doing what he's supposed to be doing as king? Because, listen, I want you to know that I'm concerned about your needs. And so if you need something, you, here, here's my card. You give me a call. You got my number. And he's doing this day and night, day and night. And he's over here, and he's, and he's moving upon the hearts of the people. And the Bible says he stole the hearts of the people away from David. And then he moves into his into his his house and listen we don't have time to talk about concubines and multiple wives right now i can tell you it was never god's will but nevertheless he had so absalom starts sleeping with all of all of david's harem okay out in public to let everybody know that and he was purposefully trying to disgrace him but you know what's crazy is that god told david when he failed and he Slept with Bathsheba. Not only this, but the son that she had for him or the child that she had for him died. And God, whenever, whenever Nathan the prophet confronted David, he told him, he said, listen, a man, somebody else is going to come into your house and he's going to sleep with your wives out in public. See, the reality of it is, is this, is that whenever we open the door, the devil wants to come in and he wants to stay. And God is going to allow some things to happen in our life. And listen to me. It's because he's a good father. And he chastens. That means he disciplines those whom he loves. Many of you know what I'm talking about. Many of you have been through some things in your life after you opened the door to sin and you made some bad choices, right? And you found things happening in your life and you didn't understand why. But yet in the back of your mind, because you knew God well enough to know, you knew what was going on. And I can tell you that even once you bow your knee, it doesn't necessarily all go away. But anybody in this house this morning that has felt the relief and the grace of the Holy Spirit in their heart and life knows when the peace of God shows up, even though some of those things aren't doing better. Amen? And those are the struggles of David's life. He's been on the run from Saul. Then he was on the run from Absalom, his own son. And in the midst of all of these things, he writes this psalm in remembrance of the Lord. 
some of the main points that he talks about in, in this first verse, verse uh, eight verses is that God was his strength, that God was his protection and safety. At one point in the first eight verses, he felt like he was overwhelmed with fear. Y'all know what I'm talking about this morning? Listen, we live in the midst of a society that if we're honest with one another, this is, there is so much going on in the world today. I mean, there's always been stuff going on in the world. I want you to understand that. But we understand that there's more going on in the world today because we're more aware of it through social media and all the other things. There's so many stressors in life, so many empty spots that we're looking to fill. Do I need to plug in all, like, I know I say it all the time, but, but single women desire a husband and single men desire a wife and, and, and people have financial situations that they're, that they're, that they're going through and, and young people are trying to be, uh, want to be relevant to their friends and, and old people want to be relevant to their friends and, and there's just so many different things that are going on and we get ourselves caught up in some of the things of the world, whether we meant to or not, it doesn't matter. I'm telling you, there's collateral damage. Yeah. And the enemy, he hates you and I if we love God. And he just pours on the attack. And then sometimes we go and we open up doors. Yeah. We open up doors and we don't understand why everything's in so much havoc. But, and, God, and I don't need to know what doors you open because I ain't over here trying to tell you my doors. But at the same time, I know when I open the door, I'm like, uh-oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why'd you do that, preacher? Yeah. Uh-oh. Yeah. yeah. And, and the enemy tries to come in, and he tries to attack, and he tries to cause confusion. And external stressors, listen, this is a little science right here. I'm not going to, I don't, where science doesn't meet up with the word of God, I throw it in the, out the window. But where it meets up with the word of God, I hold on to it. There was one guy named Hans Selye back in the 40s, long story, but he, he came up with the term stressors. He, he coined that phrase. It was never stressors. What is a stressor? It's an external thing that causes internal change. I wish that they really understood the difference between the brain and the mind. I wish they really understood the soul, the inner part of the man. That's God's business. I got into a big old conversation with a PA student the other day. I said, no, let me tell you the difference. I'm sorry she didn't agree with me, and I didn't mean to cause trouble, but it is what it is. It, she, finally, she kind of understood finally what I was saying. She said, it's so abstract, though. I said, yes, it is. But praise God, God lets you see it. See, the soul of man is translated from the Greek word psyche. Mental health is different than physical health. Psyche, suke, soul is the place that's God's business, my friends. Your mind is different than your brain. She was trying to make the point that you can stimulate the brain and the leg kick. You could be in a comatose state and you could do something and you could initiate a reflex. Initiate a reflex. That goes to show you that the, even though the brain theoretically should send a signal to the body and cause it to work, the mind and the brain are not exactly the same thing. Because you can tell your brain, oh, no, everything's going to be okay. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not in harm's way. And at the same time, your mind or your soul is all up in torment and turmoil. And like your heart, and it will actually change your heart rate. And psychology's got a happy answer for you. They're going to tell you what, you what you got going on. And they're going to get a little code for it. You can charge, you can bill for the services. Write your little prescriptions. But they can put all the flood, all your receptors and all your neurotransmitters all they want to, but they ain't going to change your mind. They might try to change the chemistry in your brain. That's why they, they can change the chemistry in your brain all day long. And at the same time, it still don't work. Oh, it might work for a little bit, but why it ain't working all the time? Because the brain and the mind ain't the same thing. And what we're talking about right here in this inner man, this is God's business. Amen, amen. And I can tell you that David, even before they ever had diagnoses like this, David was feeling some of this stuff. As he's running to the cave of Adullam, as he's, as he's running for his life, as he's acting like a crazy man with spittle dripping down his beard because he's fierce for his life and he's trying to figure out anything that he can do in order to preserve his life, I can tell you that that's why he had to cry out to himself. He said, oh, soul, why are you downcast within me? 
He speaks to his own soul. I can promise you David has felt the pain that you felt. And that he's felt the pain that I felt. And the frustration and the uncertainty of not knowing what's going to happen next. Irrational fear. Everybody in this place right here knows God is more than capable. So that means whenever fear overwhelms us, it's irrational. We know it's coming from somebody else, and it ain't coming from the Lord. He was overwhelmed by fear. But he cries out to God. <laughs> he cries out to God. He knows where to go. Praise God for you this morning, church. If you don't know where to go yet, hopefully by the end of the message, you'll know where to go. And if you've been coming from a, for a while, you already know where to go. Praise God to be a person that knows where to go. You can be like the rest of the world out there. I don't care how long you've been running. <laughs> and let me tell you, a couple of my daughters, they've been, well, I only got two of them. They've been running to some extent. But yet at the same time, she'll, the older one will call up Danielle and say, Mama, we was going through this. We didn't know what to do. And I prayed, and the Lord gave me the words that I needed to say. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Praise God that you know where to go. Yeah. Because there's a whole world out there that's hurting, and they don't know where to go. And they're looking for answers, and they're searching, and they're seeking, and they can't find. Because we got people in the church that are talking about the rain and mulling over things that won't live past today. And time is not on the side of their friend. And maybe this time. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, what a good song. What a good line. Maybe this time, with the fire of God in my eyes, I will speak the words of life. Hallelujah. Under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Do you have to be loud like the preacher? No. Does your face have to turn red? No. You can just say one word, two words. Serve him. And under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, everybody in the room can feel it. God rushes towards humility, my friend. He resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Humble yourself, therefore, into the mighty hand of God. Surrender to the will of God. Amen. I want you, I want you to know, surrender to the will of God and do not be consumed with the thoughts and the perceptions of man in the world. You, you are, you're amen in me pretty loud this morning. But when you walk out of this church, and I'm not fussing because I go through the same thing you go through. So y'all, if y'all hang around long enough, you'll see my heart. A lot of people misunder, misinterpret me. I'm just, I, we only got so much time. So I'm just trying to get it out. But, but what I'm trying to say is, is that we, we're amening in here, but then when we get out there, we got to face them. Right, right. we got to face the, the world that's out there. And we see the way they look at us and the way they scoff. And that's why we need the confidence of the Lord, my friend. That's why we need the infilling of the Holy Spirit. That's why we need the baptism. Because we need the power of God resident on the inside of us where we can look the snickers <laughs> or the, whatever it is, the, the, little, the little glint in their eye where they think they're so cool. We can look right at it in their eyeballs and we can be confident in the Lord, to know that we have the answer and that they don't even know the answer. Amen? All right. He cries out to God in the midst of all of that, and I want you to know this is the last point that I saw, that God's help is supernatural. I want you to see that. So let's just take a little closer look. In verse 1, King David recognized God as his source of strength. Amen? Amen? Look in Psalm 18, 1, he says, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock. I put those two words down at the bottom, rock and horn, because both of those words in the Old Testament describe strength. Now, he's using this word in, in English, is called, it, it's called a metaphor, where you use an object to describe something. So he's talking about the strength of God, and he uses these two metaphors, a rock and a horn. Now, one of the things, you know, I don't know what you would use today to describe uh, strength. Would you use the rock, meaning Dwayne Johnson? I mean, I know that's silly, but I'm just saying, like, it, you know, context changes. But whenever he's talking about rock, he ain't talking about Dwayne Johnson. If you could imagine living inside of your house and walking outside and seeing one of those big rock structures, 
you know, like whether it be in the southwest, Arizona, Utah, wherever they are, the Mesa area, right? Or if you lived in the, on the coast of California, you have those big old boulders and the waves crash on those boulders every day. And every day in your little vapor of life, you could walk out your back door. Wouldn't that be nice if you could walk out there and just look at the ocean Pacific and you could see waves crashing on that rock? I guarantee you every morning when you wake up, you're going to see that rock. That rock is a sign of stability. That rock is a sign of strength. That rock is not going anywhere today. That rock will be there tomorrow when you wake up. So as an ancient writer of the Bible or a songwriter, when he walks outside the door, he says, you are my rock, you are my strength, and the horn may not mean a lot to you. That's why they put horns on the altar. That's another story for another time. But the horn was a sign of strength too. And see, to you and I, that may not mean a lot, but if you lived up in the Judean hills and they got rams up there, and every now and then when you walk out there and you drink in your coffee, and all of a sudden you see two bucks rutting, and they take off running. You ever seen that on National Geographic before, two rams fighting? Oh, my gosh. Is that something? Dude, that is something, man. You talk about, if if you played football, you'd be like, wow. They just take off running. Pow! The strength of a horn. He's using metaphors to describe because he's experienced God's strength moving and operating in his life. And I want you to know this morning that even though sometimes you feel weakness in your life, you feel vulnerable, and you don't feel like you have the answers on what you're going to do, you need to understand God wants to be your rock, and he wants to be your horn. He wants to be your source of strength. He wants you to know that you can trust him. And listen, the apostle Paul said this, in my weakness, see the apostle Paul learned something. In my weakness, his strength is made perfect. Dude, that is so powerful. Because you might be here this morning, and you might be saying, I'm trying, preacher. I'm trying. In a way, that's kind of part of the problem. <laughs> you need to quit trying and you need to start quitting. Not quit striving. Quit trying in your own strength. Quit trying in your own strength. Fall to your knees, throw your hands in the air, and surrender to the will of God, to the strength of God, understanding you're my rock, you're my horn. I can't do it, but I know David got the revelation. I need you to give it to me, God. I want to get a revelation of your strength. Amen? Amen. So I wanted you to see that in verse 1, King David recognized God as his source of strength. Here's a a couple other scriptures we can read out of Psalm 118, verses 14 through 18. You know, the psalmist, he wrote all kind of songs like this. The Lord is my strength and song. I'm pretty sure the song y'all sang today talked about God being the rock, but also the song. Isn't that something? I mean, I don't plan, I could, if I preach all this stuff in detail, we won't ever get out of here. But look, isn't that something? Wouldn't it be nice if the Lord became our song? That's good. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, you ever been driving, not driving down the road? I don't listen to a lot of radio or music anymore. And look, there's nothing wrong with it as long as it's the right stuff. But, you know, back in the day, I, had, I would have a song that I might be singing. And it wasn't really good lyrics most of the time. But, you know, music has a way of getting on the inside of you, right? I'm just saying. So if you're, uh, look, I don't mean to go off on doing an example of a song, but I'm just trying to say you pick a song that's popular today in the world that you like, okay, and probably if you dissect the lyrics, you're going to realize, am I really singing that? Okay, that's all I'm trying to say. But what, well, how beautiful it is when God becomes your song, <laughs> whenever he's the thing that fills your heart. And the lyrics of God come flowing out of your heart, out of your mouth. Amen. The psalmist said, he's my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. The voice of rejoicing. And salvation is in the tabernacles of the righteous. You know, in some of the other translations, it uses the word tent. The word tabernacle and tent means the same thing. But I kind of like the word tent here. And the reason why is because I think the context is not talking about the house of God. It's talking about the house of the believer. And what it's saying is, is that wherever the believer is, the presence of the Lord is there also. Amen. So God is in the tabernacles or the tents of the righteous. Look at this. His right hand. The right hand shows power in ancient times. In the, in the, in the I don't know if it's Greek or Latin, but dexter, right, sinister, left. For some reason, they thought left-handed dead, it was a bad thing. It was, it was evil. Okay. But the right hand was, was the source of power. 
Okay, and but if you're left-handed, that's at the same time. You know, the Bible talks about the, the Bible talks about left-handed people, but at the same time, the, in the tribe of Benjamin, they had all these people that could sling a rock, and they were all left-handed, and it went on and on about how accurate they were. So I don't know if you've ever seen major league pitchers, but them left-handed ones are really, really good. Okay, so that's I, I'm trying to say that because I'm trying to save myself because I know they probably got some left-handed people in here. All right. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord, look at this. The Lord has chastened me. Don't miss this. The Lord, what does that mean? He's disciplined me. He has instructed me. The Lord has chastened me sore. (laughs) It hurt Have you ever been corrected by your parents before? Uh, Ooh, it hurt. I know when I was in military school, I got chastened sore many a time. Ooh, Mr. Drill Sergeant, can you take one off, please, sir? I'm talking about how many times I get paddled. The Lord has chastened me sore. Sometimes the correction of the Lord, it hurts a little bit. It's painful. But don't quit on the Lord. Amen? Hold on to Jesus. But he has, given, he has not given me over to death. So while sometimes we go through seasons in our life and things aren't going our way, and we believe that it's probably connected to some decisions we made in the past, we're probably right. The Holy Spirit is probably ministering that to us and revealing that to us. But listen, hold on to the Lord. Endure the chastening of the Lord is what the book of Hebrews says. Receive the correction of God. Why? Because in the end, guess what it says? You will become partakers of his holiness. That means as he changes you and he changes me, we're going to start to look more like Jesus and less like us. But we have to endure. And really and truly, anything that stands in the way of that, I'm just saying, whether it's your cheerleader friends or whether it's your other friends or whether it's your mama or your daddy or whether it's your wife, (laughs) I, am I tell, oh, you're telling me to get a divorce preacher? I didn't, the word divorce didn't come out of my mouth until I saw you thinking about it. <laughs> I'm just saying. I ain't telling nobody to get no divorce. I'm trying to make a point. If that other person is trying to prevent you from getting close to the Lord, you better shut that down, my friend. You better take your stand for the Lord. Because they're trying to, no, 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 they're trying to rob you of your strength. They're trying to rob you of your protection. They're trying to rob you of your stability. No, don't let them steal that from you. You make the choice in your heart that you are going to serve the Lord and bring their name before the Lord, and guess what will happen? God will minister to you. He will show up in the tabernacle of the righteous. He will show up in the tent of the righteous, and he will do a work in the heart and life of those people. So you stand strong for God, and you serve God out in the open. Amen? He's a rock. He's a horn. The Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. So in verse 1, David cries out about the strength of the Lord. In verse 2, he calls upon the protection and the safety of God. And look at these words, fortress, uh, safety and protection, shield. That's another word for buckler, okay? Shield, high tower, fortress. Look, I've never been on a battlefield with arrows flying at me. <laughs> but, I mean, I can imagine that that's a pretty stressful thing, I would think, right? Could you imagine how stressful it would be if you realized you forgot your shield? I mean, it was bad enough as it was, okay, but you forgot your shield. And, and then, really, a buckler was a smaller shield that most warriors would carry on the left side of the hand, with, or if they were right, left-handed, they carried the shield in their right hand, and they'd wield the sword with the opposite. So they could, they could fight off defensive blows and, and then come back with an offensive blow. Either way, whether it's a big shield or a small shield, the point is it's protection and safety. And the point is, is that if you don't have it, you're vulnerable. Could you imagine if a bunch of people were chasing after you and you found a high tower, and you were able to get through the door and lock and bar the door and then run up some stairs where you were all the way at the top and you were just looking down at them and they couldn't get in there. They couldn't do anything to hurt you. See, now you would feel safe. 
Sometimes whenever we're going through things and the struggles of life, and we talked about it, sometimes it's irrational. It doesn't make sense. We know God is greater than the things that we're dealing with, but yet at the same time, we feel as though we're being stricken by fear. I want to encourage you this morning to understand that the psalmist had to find it out for himself, but his God was his strength, but he was also his safety and his protection. God was a fortress. God was a high tower. God was a shield. Hallelujah. Not just on the battlefield, but in the battle of life. He is what you need. He is the answer that you seek. I can promise you that. Well, why can't I find him then, preacher? It's not like I haven't called out for the help of the Lord. Well, you keep on calling, my friend, and you don't give up. Hallelujah. And just like, just like they, they talked about in the gospel, there was an old lady and she kept on knocking. She kept on knocking and she told that judge, I need you to do this. I need you to do that. And that judge, he didn't even love God. And he said this. He said, this woman's going to wear me out. This woman is going to wear me out. She won't quit asking. I'm going to just give it to her so that she'll leave me alone. And God said this, I'm not evil. I'm not wicked. I want to give you good things. See, I want you to understand that this morning. One thing that you're going to learn about this church is I'm not going to sit here and just tell you a whole bunch of happy words to make you feel happy. Because I got to tell you something. The world is real. The struggle is real. The earth is fallen according to the word of God. And the people on this earth are fallen. And you are not in a war against flesh and blood, but against demonic spirits, against the forces of evil. And they want to destroy you. They want to depress you, oppress you, and they want to make you miserable, and they want to beat you down until you feel hopeless and helpless and that you don't have any other option. And they're trying to destroy you. But God wants to be your high tower, your fortress, your shield. You don't have to be on the battlefield without the Lord protecting you. And so you keep on crying out to the Lord. And listen, if you will stay true, he will be true. I promise you. God is always on time. If you think God's not on time, no, your clock's broke. God is always on time. He knows exactly what he's doing. Do you believe that today? Yeah. I hope you believe God enough to believe. Listen, preacher, I ain't even seen none of this stuff you're talking about in my life yet. I hope you believe it enough and that the Holy Spirit would witness to your heart right now enough to believe. They used to say back in the old church, they'd hit him. The boy's right, you know. He's telling the truth. I can feel it. I might not have seen it manifest in my life yet, but I can feel it that God is able to be my shield, my fortress, my high tower. He's able to be my rock. He's able to be my horn. I believe that God can do it. That's the difference between somebody that serves God and somebody that doesn't. That's the difference between a church like this and another one down the road. They're not going to sit here and tell you both sides of the story. Back in even some of the churches that I used to go to, they meant well, but it was like it was all a bunch of fluff, my friend. It was all a bunch of fluff. There was an entertainment show. And, if, and look, if you don't like the entertainment or the flavor I got today, you might go find somebody else tomorrow. We ain't got time for that. That's a, that's a facade. What does that mean? It's like a, a fake front that makes it look like something that it's not. I'm here to tell you God is real. And God is in the trenches with you. And he wants to be your strength and he wants to be your safety. Hallelujah. But you got to learn the Lord. We got to learn of God. Amen. All right. Let me keep going. At some point, he was overwhelmed by fear. He was overwhelmed by fear from man and death. And, you know, these are my words right here. I mean, I'll put that. Free, free us from fear, Lord. Amen. That's a prayer real good in the middle of my message. Free us from fear, Lord. Fear comes in many ways, shapes, and sizes. I feel like I talk way too much about my daddy in here, so I'm not even going to talk about it. But I can tell you one thing. Fear. I'm sure he had them, but he wasn't going to let me know it. Because anybody that showed fear was like, as far as he was concerned, he probably had a different word, but he'd call him a sissy at least. But reality of it is, is that all people, that's, I mean, I, mean, I hate to say it, but daddy, why are you drinking so much? Yeah. If you ain't got no fear, why are you trying to numb all that pain, man? What's going on? You trying to escape the pain of this world. You so tough. You know, there's a whole different battle out there, my friend, when it comes to the spiritual realm. And I got I to gotta tell you that we all, we don't, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. But guess what? We serve the one that does. 
Amen. I wish, I wish I could sing, praise God, one day at a time, sweet Jesus. One day at a time, sweet Jesus. Hallelujah. Not one day, one minute. Lord, I don't know what I'm going to do five minutes from now, but right now I'm going to praise you. Right now I'm going to take a, ta a chance and believe that you are my rock, my shield, my high tower, my fortress. You are my horn. Right now, this minute, that's what I'm going to believe. I'm going to believe that that's what you are, my strength and my protection. Fear, free us from fear, O oh Lord. He said, look what David said. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. I want to try to challenge your brain to work a little bit different than maybe it was in the past. And this is something, part of this is experience. I know I've shared this story before, but when I first started preaching in, at Crossing Place, I preached two Sunday morning, not Sunday morning services, two Sunday school classes. And the, and the guy that used to be the mayor of the town of Franklin he challenged me at the second one. Well, the third one. The second one, he said, the message you're preaching is like an x-ray, and it's looking into my soul. I said, that's what the message of the cross will do, bro. It'll show you yourself. But then the, the third week, he said, you can't preach your experience. I said, excuse me, sir. I can preach my experience all day long as, lo as long as it lines up with the word of God. I'm not over here to preach no experience that's not lining up with the word of God. And one of the things that I learned in the distress of my life when my sister took her life, Great pain, great sorrow. See, I'm not talking to you about something that I don't know. I've experienced, I felt it. I know I've said it before, and I don't mean to be weird, but I can remember groaning and crawling on the floor in my living room. And it's kind of gross, but I had tears and snot pouring out of my face. And I was groaning from deep distress and calling on the Lord. And God showed up. God showed up. So what, I, what is my point to this story? My point to this story is this, is that when people find themselves in the midst of great distress, sometimes they feel hopeless. But if you're a believer that you know that God is real and you find yourself in distress, God moves towards a broken and a contrite heart. The word of God says in Isaiah, he says that his eyes, the eyes of God roam to and fro looking for a broken and a contrite spirit for he will not despise that. He moves towards brokenness and humility. So if you find yourself in great distress, call upon the Lord. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. Amen? Look, at that's the whole verse. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple. Isn't that good? Oh, man, that's so good. Like, I, I could just preach for hours. I know y'all can't sit there that long, but I could preach for hours. He cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him, even into his ears. I'm here to tell you that the God of glory that scattered the scars, stars in the sky and breathed life into that lump of clay called Adam, he will hear your cry in the temple when you call out from distress, and it will come into his ears. And he will hear you. He will take notice of you. I need you to believe that with me this morning. Because I don't want you to leave here, even if you don't like me when you leave this morning. You will not leave this place without having he heard that, that, there, that there's hope. You will not leave this place this morning like the rest of this world that doesn't understand that there's hope. No, you will have been told before you leave this morning that there's hope, and his name is Jesus. I wish I had time to teach. But all that Jesus did was for the purpose so that you could access the Father, so that you could become a believer, so that you could be filled with the Spirit of God, so that you could reproduce after your own kind. God wants to do a work in you, but not just so he can fix all your problems. People, don't, people oh, no, change the channel. I, I need him to fix my problems, preacher. That's fine. If you got some problems in here this morning, first, first level of business is to get your, he wants to help heal your house. Amen? He cares about you. He wants to help you with your bills. He wants to help you in your relationships. He wants to help you with all of that stuff. He wants you to, he, he wants to fix. So start serving him and in your distress, cry out on the Lord. Amen? And then guess what? Once he starts fixing you, it might take a year. It might take two years. But if you'll trust him and you'll serve him, once he starts fixing you, next thing you know, you're going to be writing a psalm. <laughs> next thing you know, God's going to be the song of your heart. 
You're going to be singing a song. Lord, I praise you because I know that you are my rock, you are my shield, you are my strong tower. Hallelujah. It's going to become your song. I don't know that I really have time for all to do all of these, but let's go ahead. Fear, free us from fear, Lord. I want to, let, let's go to 2 Timothy 1. 2 Timothy 1, verse 7. Y'all just bear with me a little bit. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of a love and of a sound mind. Look at verse 8. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. You know, in 2 Timothy, the apostle Paul's about to get his head chopped off. He's in a Roman prison. This thing is getting on my nerves. He's in a Roman prison. He's about to get his head cut off. And Timothy, it seems like, is maybe ashamed of it. Can you imagine what people are saying? Oh, yeah, he must not have been doing something right. He's in prison. The people of God, you know, according to the word of faith doctrine, you should be driving a Rolls Royce and wearing a three-piece suit. And if you're not, then you're not fav highly favored of the Lord. He's in prison, getting his head cut off tomorrow. Paul says, so, so Timothy's facing some things that you and I may not have to face. He's a, he's a pastor, a young pastor, and he's being intimidated by people, and the spirit of fear is trying to grip his heart and trying to make him feel unworthy. And the Apostle Paul's letting him know God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. So you're not a, you may not be a pastor this morning. You may not have to deal with this, but what is it that you're dealing with? Because let me tell you this, God doesn't want you to be plagued by a spirit of fear. Because just like he wanted to use Timothy, he wants to use you. He might use you different than he used Timothy and different than he uses me, but he does not want you plagued by a spirit of fear. He wants you to be free because he wants you to be able to, to be a witness for him to live your life for him, to serve him. Amen? Here's another scripture, Philippians 4, verse 7. And the peace of God. He says, be careful for nothing. If I went to another translation, well, let's just go ahead and look at another one real quick. Look. Do not be anxious about anything. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Look, I was reading behind the Greek scholar that got Kenneth Weist. I read him some of his stuff to y'all Wednesday night. And he said this, in the Greek language, he called this a prohibitive. What it meant was, was that they were being anxious about everything. And the apostle Paul said, stop. I prohibit you from continuing to be bound by a spirit of fear because a spirit of fear does not come from the Lord. It comes from somewhere else. If God's not the one giving fear. So if he is not giving fear, then where is it coming from? Because he said it's a spirit. That's what, that's what the Apostle Paul said. And, the, and that if we, would do, if we would do that, then the peace of God that surpasses all understanding would minister to our hearts and lives. Last thing that I wanted to mention to you, and you know, really the singers and the musicians, y'all can kind of get started to come up here, because I always want to close service with a song, <laughs> and I want to give people an opportunity to come to the altars to be prayed with, Amen, and I want to encourage you to do that. But as they're coming up here and they're getting settled, let's try to focus on these last couple little minutes here. Because this is one of the other points that I noticed in these first eight verses. That when in his distress, he called out on the Lord. And when he called out on the Lord in his distress, his voice came into the temple of God and went into the ear of God. And then the next thing I noticed is this. God's movement was supernatural. This is what the scripture says. Now, whether or not this is just poetic language or whether or not God really brewed up a storm with hail and wind, because you'd have to read the rest of the chapter to see it, but it's talking about hail, it's talking about wind. You know, did God brew up a storm one time to save David? It's certainly possible. Or maybe he's just saying, hey, look, this is what it was like. 
I called out on the Lord. The Lord heard my cry, and then he began to move like a storm upon the earth. But this is the first part because I don't have time to read the whole thing. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations also of the hills moved and were shaken because he was wroth. In other words, God was angry because people were after his servant David. I got to tell you something this morning. That whenever you call upon the Lord in the midst of your distress, I want you to know that God is going to minister to you. And listen, God is not held by, by natural boundaries. Do you believe that this morning? I want you to believe that. It might take you a little while to believe it the way that I'm starting to believe it. Okay? But I got to tell you that the God that I serve, the God that you have access to, he's not held by natural boundaries. Everybody's trying to fix stuff in their own wisdom. Amen? But guess what? God can move and do things that you and I cannot even imagine. I want to encourage you this morning to believe that with me. They're about to play a song for us. Please, if you need prayer for anything, come to the front so we can pray with you. If not, give, just give your heart to the Lord for these next few minutes and let God know how grateful you are. Amen.